Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Greetings from beautiful Charleston, South Carolina, and welcome to Tales of the South, part of our Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. We're so glad you've joined us. I'm Helen Hill, the CEO of Explore Charleston, and we're here at 20 South Battery on the Charleston Harbor. You might want to book a room here at this fantastic inn for next year's festival when we can all be together in person. As we join the conversation today, I'd like to introduce you to our three speakers. Each of our special guests will focus on a different fictional way the South is described in the stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale's Their Eyes Were Watching God has always been one of my favorite novels. First, we have Sarah Churchwell. Sarah is a professor of English literature at the University of London. She is the author of Careless People, Murder, Mayhem, and the Invention of the Great Gatsby. Sarah is also the author of Behold America, A History of America First and the American Dream. Next, we have Kirk Kirknut. Kirk is the Executive Director of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Society and Professor of English at Troy University. Kirk is the editor of All the Bells, F. Scott Fitzgerald's Montgomery Stories. Special thanks to Kirk for cheering our event today. And wrapping up this distinguished panel, we have Patina Gapa, writer and lawyer from Zimbabwe. Her current novel revolves around Dr. Livingston's epic journey through 19th century Africa. The novel is called Out of Darkness, Shining Light. Now let's get this conversation started with Tales from the South. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Kirk Kernut, and welcome to the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. That's Charleston, South Carolina, by the way, and we're very excited to have you join this conversation. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Sarah Churchwell, who is beaming in from London, England. And uh, how are things in London, Sarah? Um, things are okay, London. As you can see, it's dark here, uh, so we're we're obviously dealing with our with our time change and you know, the coming of winter. We are uh, London has has entered a lockdown, so we are doing all of this from uh, from lockdown. But um, but great. Uh, well, I hope everyone there is staying safe. Uh, those of you who are turning in probably know we were scheduled to have another. Uh, guest with us today, but uh, Patina Grappa is uh, not available. She was uh, traveling back from uh, Harare to Edinburgh yesterday, and apparently there's been some delay, but uh, fortunately, Sarah and I uh, 
know each other well enough that we figure we can uh, uh, have a provocative and fun conversation about the American South uh, together. Uh, I'm just going to give a little background on this particular panel. The idea for it came to me when I was originally approached about doing uh, something for the festival. And um, I live in Montgomery, Alabama, which is the hometown of Zelda Fitzgerald. Uh, but I'm also only about 40 miles away from Natasalga, um, Alabama, which is where Zora Neale Hurston was born. And uh, it strikes me that for all of that uh, sort of uh, juxtaposition, we rarely ever have a conversation in which we see Fitzgerald and Hurston and the South put side by side. So we're gonna explore some of the reasons for that and uh, get into, uh, I think a conversation about the uh, American South and uh, how it's been portrayed by both of these authors, but more particularly what it means uh, in terms of the overall meaning of America today. So um, Sarah, if you're all set, I have questions for you. All right. Um, first and foremost, is there one particular work in which you would say Fitzgerald addresses the one word that I think defines the Southern experience or haunt the Southern experience, and that word is slavery? Well, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and as uh, um, people who know and love Fitzgerald know, he was a huge Civil War buff. And, um, and that's something that doesn't necessarily get into his kind of popular reputation. It's not, you know, part of how we associate him iconically. Um, but he, but he was, and his father was a Southerner from Maryland, and and he he identified strongly um, with certain aspects of, of his heritage through that um, through that genealogy. But slavery, as you as you suggest, is not something that he uh, uh, directly confronted very often. And in fact, I can only think of one um, explicit depiction of slaves in his fiction. Although you may be able to think of others, but for me, it's certainly the most familiar. Um, but it's a story that's not set in the South, um, so it might not necessarily leap to mind. Um, but it's his uh, allegory, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz, mm. uh, which was written in 1922. And it's one of my favorite of Fitzgerald's stories. Um, I, I think I think those of us who have a strong proprietary relationship to Fitzgerald sometimes think that people misread him, you know, and feel like, well, that people are, you know, getting, th I think that's true probably what, with a lot of people who love authors, like you think that somebody's getting something out of it that's not what you see and you kind of want them to see what you see in it. Um, although we should have a broad church, obviously, and everybody should love authors for all of the reasons that they love them. But anyway, the, uh, I think that Diamond as Big as the Ritz is, is such an interesting story because it's deeply satirical. And, um, and so it pushes against a lot of the kind of caricatures of Fitzgerald as a sentimentalist and a romantic and, um, and it's it's a it's a satire of American capitalism. It's a satire about monopoly capitalism, and there's a whole kind of running joke in it. Um, but it's also uh, um, the joke makes clear Fitzgerald's absolutely explicit recognition that monopoly capitalism in the 1920s was built on slavery. And there are a couple of points there. So there's an allegory about a family called Washington. So now we know we're in American allegory territory who come from Virginia. So he lines it all up. And, um, and after the Civil War, the um, kind of patriarch um, with the very uh, uh, Southern name Fitznorman Culpepper Washington, um, goes west after the war, as many Southerners did. And so it's a story about migration from the South to the West. And so we get a kind of Western, um, I mean, Western in the genre sense, um, kind of fuses with this satire. And then um, it, uh, Washington takes slaves with him. And the slaves help him uh, um, kind of create his, uh, his great monopoly capital um, empire, because he finds this diamond as big as the Ritz, this um, mountainous diamond that then he he hides, but he has the slaves do the work for him. And at the end of the story, it's really a black comedy, um, a black satire of American capitalism. And at the end, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but in order to tell, talk about literature properly, I think we often have to <laughs> reveal endings. I'm yeah, afraid that's where 
so much of the meaning resides in the ending. <laughs> so There's no spoiler uh, alerts in literature. Exactly, over and over and over again. I think we're going to be spoiling. I was whenever I talk about Gatsby, I was like, so by the way, Gatsby dies. Hate to hate yeah. to break it to you. <laughs> so at the end of um, the diamond as big as the Ritz, um, the mountain gets destroyed, and uh, what happens is the the um, one of Washington's daughters um, says. Uh, um, there go there goes twenty slaves at um, pre-war prices, right? And I think it's one of the the kind of blackest lines in in Fitzgerald. This recognition that, as I say, that kind of modern capitalism was built on on uh, a slavery, and it's not something you expect white writers in the nineteen twenties to see quite so clearly. That feels like, a, to me anyway, it feels like a much more contemporary critique. Um, that, that we're just starting as a, as a society kind of try to come to grips with that. And yeah. yet there's Fitzgerald in 1922 putting his finger on it. And of course, for writers of his generation, the Civil War uh, um, had a kind of, I always say it had a kind of analogous uh, a role to the way that World War II plays in our cultural imaginary. They recognized it as a time of rupture and remaking, which the country took a different course and the sense that modern life came from that moment. Um, is one that you do certainly see in um, in Fitzgerald's contemporaries, but not necessarily uh, um, that kind of confrontation of the role of American capital um, in slavery that you see in that story. Right. I, I have to admit, I had never thought of uh, Diamond as an allegory of the South, so I'm very excited about, about that idea. Um, I guess probably being in Montgomery, I get a little distracted by you mentioned the father, but there's an even, uh, you know, a sort of even more intense uh, relationship with the South. And so just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what his marriage in terms of brought, brought to his thinking about the South and about Zelda. And in particular, do you think we over romanticize Zelda's Southernness, if we want to call it that? Mm. Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so for Fitzgerald, um, part of the kind of allure of Zelda was clearly kind of bound up in her, um, in her life in Montgomery. And we see that um, in lots of his fiction that drew on his relationship with her. Now, we want to be clear, um, and I know you'll, you'll uh, um, agree with me on this caveat that of course to say that he drew on his relationship is not to say that the fiction is autobiographical it is not in any way a one-to-one -one correspondence but he was inspired by his life as many writers are and he reworked it in his fiction and we see um, various ways in which he depicts the kind of romance and glamour of uh, of the old south um, and the way that that hit him um, when he, he met Zelda in um, Montgomery when he was stationed there uh, during the First World War. So he was, uh, he was in training camps and he was training to go, uh, to go abroad, to go over. Um, in fact, he never did uh, see active service, but um, he was one of all of these officers who were milling around the Southern Bells and Zelda was one of the great bells, probably the great bell of Montgomery. Um, of her day. I mean, the, the Bankhead sisters gave her a run for her money, but, um, but we'll, we'll give it to Zelda because we're having a Fitzgerald conversation. Um, and, um, and so the, although I actually often think, by the way, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but when Fitzgerald ended up writing um, this set of stories set in, um, a, a, he actually moves Montgomery to Georgia and he calls it Tarleton, Georgia. And that's kind of recognizably, again, drawing on his early experiences, but he ends up with three beautiful Southern bells. And I often, I often amuse myself by thinking that they actually are the Bankhead sisters in Zelda. Oh, Although I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure the timings, but I think it mostly works out. Anyway, um, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of thing for, um, for geeks and aficionados to play around with. It's, um, these kinds of little correspondences. Um, but anyway, so he clearly was very, he was caught up in the, in the romance and the glamour of that life. But I think what you see in his fiction about the South and in some of the stories that I think we're gonna come to is that that was bound up for him in ideas about class as well, about aristocracy and about his own anxious relationship to his class. So. Um, on the one hand, um, his mother came from a kind of um, merchant 
uh, Irish class, so it was sort of working class made good, um, who, who had made a lot of money, but um, were not necessarily the most genteel or the most aristocratic of families um, in St. Paul. And then um, Fitzgerald's father, who, as I said, uh, um, was himself from Maryland, from a border state, but um, uh, was from a more aristocratic lineage. And that's the side of the family where um, Francis Scott Key, uh, who of course Scott Fitzgerald was named for and who wrote the poem that is the lyrics for uh, um, the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, all of that comes from um, the Fitzgerald side of the family. And I think when, when Fitzgerald got to, um, to the deep South and he, didn't, he wasn't only stationed in Montgomery, but that was, um, where he spent most of his time, but he spent more time traveling around the Deep South than I think people sometimes uh, recognize. He spent a little bit of time in New Orleans even, although he didn't like it, but he spent some time there just before his career kicked off. And so he was sort of experiencing the Deep South and moving around uh, um, uh, with these training camps. And um, and and that, that sense that this was an aristocratic way of life um, and that they had an aristocratic kind of uh, well, ethos is the wrong word, but a uh, sort of um, um, system um, was something that he was um, that he was very uh, um, susceptible to, and um, and of course that idea of the Deep South as being itself an aristocratic place is um, part and parcel of what we call the Lost Cause version of Southern history, right? Which Fitzgerald was um, very susceptible to, and um, Although not uncritically, and that's what's important here, is that he he recognized its its um, he recognized its sentimentalities and its dangers, but also its appeal. And the lost cause version of history, for those who aren't familiar with that phrase, is basically the idea that slavery was it's the very idealized, romanticized version of um, the antebellum South that we're familiar with from Gone with the Wind or from other uh, on these kind of idealized what's called plantation literature. And the idea that the that life in the antebellum days was idyllic and it was uh, you know Arcadian it was this um, pastoral idyll of devoted retainers and you know benign slaveholders and um, and everybody was terribly nice and everybody was terribly aristocratic and um, and it basically um, mapped uh, uh, um, mythical ideas of medievalism of feudalism onto the American South. And so that's when it imported that idea of being chivalric, of being genteel, of, um, of lords of the manor. And, and again, you know, turning slaves into serfs who were devoted to their uh, bound by, you know, by ties of land um, to the people they served. All of that stuff is basically kind of lost cause history, which says that the, the South was this romantic noble way of life that was destroyed by modernity and by the modern industrialized North. So there's this idea of, you know, kind of crass pushing modernity that's destroying this beautiful, genteel old way of life. And er these ideas about aristocracy get bound up in that. Um, largely, and I guess, I think Fitzgerald found all of that really appealing. Yeah, largely in uh, a lot of that lost cause stuff actually po post dates the end of the war. I mean, it's kind of a fiction that's generated uh, after the reconstruction era as a way of, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, justifying Jim Crow uh, and and uh, pushing back on a lot of the freedoms of the of the African Americans. Uh, you mentioned the the stories and him being um, critical of the lost cause. So let me ask you this: in the first Tarleton story, did it's called the Ice Palace. There's a scene, and I always take tourists there in Montgomery. Um, it's a it's a local cemetery. And um, it's famous today because it's where Hank Williams is buried, but Zelda's parents are there and there's still the hill that's described in the story. But um, in the story, Sally Kara Hopper goes on this long rhapsody about the South and you can really almost think of this as something that Margaret Mitchell might have, uh, you know, cobbed a little bit for, for some of the sort of frillier moments. Um, when I read that, to me that, I can't find the border between sincerity and satire in that whole dialogue. And, it, and it's capped off by the fact that after she delivers this, she and this Northern bow that she's showing around in the, uh, 
in the cemetery um, end up having a makeout scene in the, you know, in the, in the middle of this hollowed, supposedly hollowed space. So I'm just wondering, what's your, what's your take on that? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about him being critical of that lost cause rhetoric? Yeah, I think that he, I mean, I think he was, I mean, the way I read him anyway, and you may read him differently, but the way I read him is that he's certainly ambivalent about it and that, and that it evolves over time. So the, I mean, we need to remember in stories like the Ice Palace, how young he was, that's a 1920 story. It's one of his first big stories. He was just 24 when he wrote it. And, um, and it's very much clearly drawing on anxieties about the idea that, that, um, that Zelda and he might be incompatible because of their different um, backgrounds, him as a northerner from um, Minnesota and her um, from the Deep South. And, um, and I think that I share your, your feeling that it's hard to get a bead on whether it's satirical or just rhapsodic. Um, but I think that the, the degree to which um, all of his stories about the South um, end with uh, this um, with disillusionment and with the puncturing of these ideals, the nostalgia never wins out, and um, and it so there, there's a sense in which that's um, the the I always feel like he's it's the energy is of somebody trying to convince himself it's something that he wants to believe in, and yet his critical it's like head and heart, you know, but his critical intelligence just won't let him believe in it, and so there's this pull, and he's like, oh, this is beautiful, and then his critical mind is just going, but it's just complete nonsense, you know, it's nonsense. Um, and so I feel like as readers, we register that tension. I think it's one of the things that makes this story, these stories so interesting is because we can feel the friction of that critical mind at work. And the more that you read those stories, I think the more that you register those moments of uh, of, of resistance and, and, and withdrawal from it, even as he's so beautifully depicting it. Do you see that too in The Beautiful and Damned? Uh, because that novel, although it's supposedly about, uh, you know, so, sort of second generation Gilded Age um, debauchees, uh, there are forays into the South. And there's a scene in particular with Gloria Gilbert, who is not a Southerner, where they go to the home of Robert E. Lee and she kind of launches on this similar sort of rhapsody about uh, mutability. And, um, and then later on the novel goes into him being in the, in the training camp in the South. Um, you've written a lot recently about Beautiful and Damned. Do you wanna give us your spin on that one in the, in the South? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that I agree with you that that scene with Gloria uh, and, and Anthony at, I'm trying to say Anthony like a British person, Anthony, as we would say at home, um, uh, that scene at Robert E. Lee's house, I agree, is really, really interesting. And But again, it has exactly that tension we were just talking about because Gloria hates it. And the reason she hates it is because it's too modern. And she actually thinks it's kind of, I mean, we might use a modern word like kitsch to describe what she accuses it of. She says it's really vulgar and she says that it's like a like an old painted lady instead of being allowed to be to go to grow old gracefully and to be elegant and run down the way it ought to be. She says it's like a six year old who's, who's painted herself and dyed her hair and trying to look young. It says it shouldn't look new, it should look old. Right. So there's um, there's a sense there in which what is the longing is for the loss, right? The longing is for the decay. The longing is for the sense of something that is gone and can't be reclaimed. And the sense that anything that tries to actually put it in front of you is A, going to fail. Um, but B, it isn't, it's not what you want anyway, because actually what you want is the loss. So it's like the old idea that paradise is invented to be lost. I think the lost cause was also invented to be lost. And certainly in Fitzgerald's mind, it's only attractive in so far as it's lost. He wouldn't actually like any of the reality and he knows that. Um, but also the attempts to recover it, he finds, I think, um, dubious and ersatz and, uh, but so um, for that matter does Gloria. So he doesn't just put it in, um, in, the, in his own alter egos uh, language. He puts it in the language of the Southern women as well, who are also suspicious. But one of the, I think the great things about his stories of the South is how, uh, um, is how critical, how critically minded the Southern bells are. So we expect them to be kind of vapid caricatures. Uh, and, and they never, they're actually more, they understand the South much better than their, 
um, uh, male counterparts do. And they're the ones who offer the critiques of the South at various important points and of um, the relationship between what became known as the Old South and the New South. Um, and really, I think what Gloria is getting at there is a, is a rejection of the New South. So um, the, the idea that the South could rebuild after the Civil War and, and that what it, would, what it would gain in industrialization and in modernity um, would not offset all of the losses of this genteel way of life and it would become crass and pushing um, and again, really familiar from Gone with the Wind, right? That that's basically what Scarlett O'Hara embodies is the transition from the Old South to the New South and the, and the, the, the vulgar pushiness of it. Um, and, and, I, and that again is why I say that this all, these, these stories always play out against, uh, against uh, the language of class as well and around um, um, class ideas because what's aristocratic and genteel is, is the, is the correct way of being in the South in Fitzgerald stories and this kind of modernity is always suspect. Right. Um, I want to come back to that clash between the old and new South in particular to the second Tarleton story in just a sec, but you mentioned nostalgia a minute ago and your recent piece in the New York Review of Books called The Oracle of Our Unease, which is a, a fabulous piece of work. Um, you end on an on uh, on a paragraph talking about um, Fitzgerald and how he used nostalgia. And I, I just wanted you to sort of summarize, as you mentioned, the, the nostalgia associated with the lost cause. He also applied that to sort of um, America in general, I think is, is part of what you say at the end there. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that he, I think for him, the South, I think it's that the South for him became a symbol of a, or it gave him access to a kind of um, relationship to nostalgia and longing that he already had and the South kind of located it for him. Um, it gave him a specific place and a context for that, but it also was much more free floating than that for him. And that's why it appeared, I mean, it certainly is about Gatsby is entirely about nostalgia, um, you know, read uh, in, in one angle, all, everything Jay Gatsby wants to do is to recover a lost ideal of himself and a lost moment and he can't. And that's the, that's the whole tragedy of the novel is that he can't, um, he can't reclaim that. So what I was saying was that I think that Fitzgerald saw that, um, that, there, that Americans have a deeply uh, um, problematic relationship to their own past, needing to see in it the ideal of the nation having once been realized, need, needing to have this fantasy that the ideals of the nation ever were realized, that it ever was a beautiful place, that it ever was uh, um, kind and gentle or, or a place where liberty and justice prevailed or any of these kind of Jeffersonian, um, um, you know, Arcadian stories about, you know, the happy yeoman farmer and, you know, and the reality is it was never like that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and Fitzgerald was enough of a student of history to know that, but he didn't want to relinquish the longing. And he understood that that longing was, it energized him and it, and it, and it inspired his great passages of poetic beauty and the emotion that went, that, that, um, that, that gave that critical intelligence so much, so many points of connectivity with, with, um, with readers. And, and, and on some level, he knew all of that. He knew that that was kind of how he worked. So I think that when he, when he got to the South, he kind of, he recognized a kindred spirit, you know? He was like, oh, these are my people. They understand how nostalgia works. And, and precisely because of that critical intelligence that I was talking about, what he, what he, he depicts characters in the South who are suspicious of that nostalgia, who do not uncritically embrace it, but who recognize its falsities and its fabrications, but also recognize its appeal. And particularly, as I say, the bells in those stories, they keep calling out the falsities of it. They keep saying the stuff isn't true. Um, and so what I was saying in that, in that essay was that I think that he, he became so good at nostalgia because he recognized that it was, he recognized both those appeals and also the dangers of it because what I say in the piece is that is the difference between nostalgia and history is that nostalgia falsifies the past and history is trying to clarify the past. And that I think is the distinction that he's always pulling between as well. But can I just, I'll give, I'll give one, um, one quote if I can, because we're sure. describing him without 
And for me, this actually is from a story we haven't mentioned yet, but for me, it actually uh, kind of nails what I mean by him locating this idea, this feeling, um, but locating it in the South, but it's something that describes his relationship to the past and to romance and to longing more generally as well. And it comes from his, um, his later story, The Last of the Bells, um, from 1929, which is really his last great story set in the South. Right. And as that title suggests, it's the, 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 it's the goodbye to all that. Um, and there's just a little line in it, but it just comes to me, it just epitomizes um, the, the, the conjunction between the two. Um, he says, um, it's when uh, 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 the hero who has been, um, who was a soldier in the camps and, and he had this bell that he flirted with and now it's six years later and he suddenly realizes he wants to go back. And it's because he, um, he reminds, it reminds him of the lost midsummer world of my early twenties where time had stood still and charming girls dimly seen like the past itself still loitered along the dusky streets. I suppose that poetry is a Northern man's dream of the South, but it was months later that I went there. So for him, poetry and the South and that sense of one's own lost past um, and, and all of that, that loss of hope and, and, that, 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 uh, and, and your, your own youthful longing and that, and that kind of you know, sad sense that you've moved on and you almost wish you could recapture that youthful longing again um, and that lost midsummer world. The South became that lost midsummer world for him. That's a great way of putting it. Um, one more Fitzgerald question and then I wanna come back to, uh, I wanna come to Hurston for just a second. Um, the second Tarleton story is called The Jelly Bean, and it was written only a few months after The Ice Palace. But to me, it's a little bit of a different story, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned the clash in the bells between, um, in the way that they sort of negotiate the old and the new South. When I read Nancy Lamar in The Jelly Bean, who is the, the, the pursued bell, um, I sense a, a woman who's a little more New South than S Sally Carroll. So correct me if I'm wrong or praise my uh, perception <laughs> if I'm right. I, well, I, don't, I, I love that you've set me up to be the arbiter. Uh, well, <laughs> how yeah. I look at it is the way it is and I shall pound my gavel um, and declare it so. Um, I, I certainly read it as you do, absolutely. I think of the three, so there's Ailey Calhoun in The Last of the Bells, uh, Sally Carroll Hopper in um, The Ice Palace, and then uh, um, uh, uh, Nancy Lamar in um, um, Jelly Bean. And, um, and I agree, she is, uh, she drinks too much, unlike the other girls, uh, which is a clear thing about Southern Bells. There's, again, that gentility and aristocracy and about the fine ladies who have a kind of antebellum, uh, um, uh, you know, decorum. Um, and again, that's that, that aristocratic dislike of anything that's too vulgar. And it's very Daisy-like as well for people who know Gatsby better. Um, her horror at anything that's too vulgar and her preference for gesture over emotion, um, that there are certain forms that you follow and you know how the world is supposed to work. Um, and Ailey Calhoun is, is um, in The Last of the Bells very much in that model. She is, she is horrified when things go away from the form and she tries to return to the form, even though she's modern in other ways too. So what he really shows, I think, is, is, is young women who are trapped between those two ideals, trying to find modernity, but having grown up with, these, with this um, uh, a belief in the beauty of the forms. And so how can they retain the beauty of the forms and the elegance of the old ways? but also embrace modernity. And Nancy's the one who can't do it. Like she just doesn't manage it at all. And so I think hers is the most, her, she has the most kind of sordid uh, um, ending for a reason. Yeah. Um, it almost feels is, punitive to me. It's yeah. like, you know, this is, this is her. And we should say that her fate is to end up married to the heir to a fortune that comes from disposable razor blades, which I guess doesn't get much more modern or new South than that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's very, it's very Henry James, right? It makes me think of the ambassadors when the Woolet family, yeah. you know, they, they, they made a fortune from something that can't even be we named. Can't even discuss. Right? Yes. Uh, exactly, and then there is that sense, but there's also that sense with um, Ailey Calhoun in The Last of the Bells when, um, um, well, I'm blanking on his name, but um, uh, Earl Schoen, 
um, who she thinks she likes in uniform and then she sees him out of uniform and she's horrified because suddenly she can, she, he's wearing all the wrong things and he just is just awful. Um, he's wearing but again, a hat with a big feather that every time I read that, I think he's walked in from like an episode of Starsky and Hutch or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So he's he's wildly Congress. out of place, exactly, exactly. Yeah. He's wildly out of place. And um, and she suddenly, see, and, of course, and again, this is very, very class conscious. It's very class inflected. Um, he seemed like he could be aristocratic. And then when she sees him in his true colors, it's an absolutely impossible relationship. And she can't imagine that they could ever be together. But it's also that conflict comes into the ice palace where um, although it's set up as a conflict between North and South, the fight that Sally Carroll, um, and again, I'm blanking on his name, but- um, Harry uh, Bellamy. Thank you. Um, uh, that she and Harry have at the, um, just before, um, so, so it's the, the, the cold, her dislike of the cold in that story is really symbolic of their incompatibility. Um, but their fight comes out over his, thinking of his not being able to read the aristocracy of the South and of his, of, of his mistaking, uh, um, 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 again, I think these relationships between Old and New South. So it's something that, um, that Fitzgerald remained really interested in. And I think that each of the three heroines, and I think they are heroines, they're kind of tragic heroines, but they're heroines. Um, he, he, he has each of them play out a different conflicted relationship to modernity. And Nancy, I think from his point of view, gets it the most wrong and therefore has the most punitive outcome. Right, right. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the, the sort of presence of African-Americans in Fitzgerald's fiction in these three stories. Let's, uh, let me ask you this. How, first off, give us a characterization of how he portrays black people in these stories. But then what can we, what can we get out of, say, reading one of those stories alongside a Zora Neale Hurston story or a novel set in the South? What's the benefit of that? Yeah. Um, yeah, as you say, so he um, he has extremely stereotypical uh, um, and passing depictions of, of African Americans in these stories. Um, they're really there as accessories, and they're there to buttress uh, um, white governance. Really, I mean, they're there they're there to show white people being elegant and um, cultured. And they're there as foils and, and counterpoints. And um, you know, he uses uh, extremely racist language in very casual ways um, that were very typical of the time. He calls them darkies. He calls them pickaninnies, and he uses ruder words. And those were, you know, as as I'm sure all of our listeners know, that was you know kind of standard way for white Americans to talk about um, African Americans at the time, which is not to excuse it, but just to say it was. Um, it was common and it wasn't, it wasn't um, consciously malevolent. Um, it was just absorbing all of these, um, you know, white prerogatives and, and universalizing them and assuming that they were, um, that they were normal. So it's a, it's a highly racist worldview and a highly racist um, uh, racialized worldview. Um, um, seeing those divides as being uh, um, definitive. Um, so, uh, you know, it's um, the role of race in Fitzgerald is, is complicated. You and I could have a whole hour long conversation easily about that question rather than about his depiction of the South. Um, but in these stories in the South, he uses um, black characters in pretty much the way you would think he would. Uh, you would predict a white writer in 1920, you know, with his background um, to do and very insensitive and just thoughtless, just really thoughtless. Right. Um, but that's exactly to your point about, you know, why reading Zora at that point becomes so important. I sorry, I shouldn't call her Zora, but we're getting familiar. Um, Hurston. Um, and um, because Hurston really, what makes Hurston so important in this, and of course she's a little bit later, but what makes her so important um, to the Harlem Renaissance in general, to African American literature in the 20th century, um, the, the whole kind of scope of her, of her, um, of her radicalness and of her transformative effect on African-American literature first and then on American literature more broadly um, 
was that, um, as, as I'm sure some of the listeners will know, she was a student of anthropology at Columbia, and she took on an anthropological, uh, she, she wanted to use anthropology as a way to reclaim and celebrate Black culture in a way that simply hadn't been done before um, in American literature. And so that, you know, up until Hurston, Black dialect had been used strictly as a form of mockery by white writers. Um, and it was a way to show that their non-standard English showed that they were, you know, stupid or illiterate or whatever it was supposed to show, but that they were a, a, a butt of the joke. And, um, and what Hurston did so that up until that up until Hurston, the, the kind of um, counter strategy to that, of course, had been for black writers to show their mastery of standard English. So Frederick Douglass being the wonderful example, right, to show that I, I am just as good at English as you are. And in fact, I'm better than you are. Um, look what I can do with the language when you actually when I actually am able to learn it. Um, but then what Hurston does is, is turn that and say, actually, I want to reclaim African American vernacular and I want to write it in the way that it is spoken. And so she came at it as a folklorist and she came at it as somebody who wanted to protect oral history and oral cultures. And, um, and she went um, through the Deep South, um, spent a lot of time in Florida in particular, um, actually recording stories and I mean, I mean, you know, audio recording them as well as writing them down and um, and wrote uh, um, books of um, uh, that, that capture that folklore. Uh, Mules and Men is a wonderful one where she actually puts down these um, folk tales that she was encountering as she heard them. So it's a sympathetic rendering of the vernacular that's not there in a, mo in a mocking or satirical spirit, but um, uh, that wants to give it its identity and to let it sing, to, to say, this is beautiful and let's listen to it. Um, and so I think that, and, and of course, in her great masterpiece, Their Eyes Were Watching God, that's really uh, what she does is she starts with the standard English narrator to show that she can do it. And then she drops away and says, but now we're going to go into the vernacular and it's all going to be about voice and it's all going to be about personal experience. And so to read um, her and Fitzgerald at this time against each other, I mean, certainly it doesn't do Fitzgerald any favors in that regard. It certainly doesn't um, suggest him being ahead of his time in some of the ways that he is often credited with being when we think about how Gatsby is a prophetic novel, for example, there were ways in which Fitzgerald was ahead of his time and we liked those of us who like Fitzgerald like to talk about him as a prophetic writer. But he certainly wasn't ahead of his time in everything and if you if you compare these stories and what Hurston is doing, you can see just how completely innovative and how energetic and how kind of 21st century her approach is um, really properly ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, I was when you were talking about dialect. I, I taught last week. I was teaching uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and telling the students about his sort of frustration at becoming famous for writing dialect poems, but then having a you know a book that uh, you know um, half were dialect poems and half were standard English. And you know, having William Dean Howells tell him, no, we only, you know, the dialect poems are what you're really going to be known for, and and him really resenting that. So I think you're exactly right that Hurston really was was of that generation that was able to come in and and sort of say, this is our language, this is our uh, the way we hear and the way that we speak, and we're not going to apologize for it, um, and. Um, the other thing that struck me as you were speaking was the the sort of the other greatest hit of Hurston's that gets taught a lot is the Gilded Six Bits, which ends with a scene of two white men being absolutely oblivious to the richness of an African American couple's domestic life together that's gone through a lot of stages and basically the uh, ironic ending of the story is these shopkeepers going, these black people have never known a day of grief in their life. They're so happy-go-lucky, which of course is the stereotype of the of the South. And I always, I, I would, it just entered my mind that maybe Fitzgerald was kind of one of those shopkeepers, um, you know, in the way that he's, in the way that he's looking at those lives. Um, let's go back to, uh, Last of the Bells real quick, and then I want to switch gears a little bit to Gatsby in the South. 
But you mentioned Ali Calhoun. I am always sort of baffled when I read some of the comments that um, mentors of mine, older generations that we, we won't name them here, obviously, but um, who take a very uh, dismissive view of, of Ali and want to see her as sort of, a, I don't know, a Kardashian of the South or something like that, <laughs> something silly like that. <laughs> probably lose my job for just <laughs> offering that analogy. But um, talk a little bit about your response to Allie and, and uh, you know, how you, how you see her, uh, as her role in that story. Yeah, um, well, I'm glad you asked that because I actually, um, I really see her, um, and I agree with you that that is, uh, um, was once a kind of standard take um, that, that, you know, I certainly was taught um, as well. And I, I think that she, um, that, that this, like, they, they treat her as this, as you say, as this kind of superficial and, and, um, and, and, and thoughtless character. Um, there, there is a tragedy in the middle of the story and her response to it is uh, problematic, certainly. But I think that's what makes her interesting um, uh, from my point of view. And, um, and I'm not, that is, having said we wouldn't plot spoil, I won't give everything away. Um, but she, um, I see her very much more as a tragic character where, um, as I, I think she exemplifies that idea I was talking about earlier of being trapped between the old and the new. And, and that there's this line in the, in the story where, and I, it's one that I, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on it actually, because I, I come back to it again and again, when um, Fitzgerald's narrator, and it's the only one of these stories that's narrated in the first person, so Fitzgerald's narrator um, is this older and wiser guy who, as I say, so you know, has always been in love with her, um, and um, and he's and he describes her at one point as being on to herself, um, and it's something that I come back to again and again because Fitzgerald doesn't spell it out. He just says she was on to herself, and this was why she could never find the right guy. Basically, is the gist of the passage, um, and that question of what he thinks that. What is the heart of that deception? What, what aspect of herself is she onto? What truth about her own character is he saying that she was onto even though nobody else recognized it? And there are different ways you can read the passage. He gives us clues. Um, but I think that, that that sense of being onto yourself when nobody else is, um, and that she's looking for somebody who can actually see, you know, see the real her, um, to put it in more sentimental terms. Um, and that she can't, she can never find somebody who can do that, who can recognize the way in which she is, is legitimately a little bit of both. She is legitimately a little bit old world and she's legitimately a little bit new world. And she would need somebody who could appreciate both sides of her um, in that way. Her, he, he describes her at the beginning of the story as somebody who, who is full of energy in this kind of lazy culture and, and that spark of energy keeps um, pushing her forward and yet she's got nowhere to go. So it's a story about kind of, you know, where can this take her? And, um, and, it, and, and again, and it's also a story about, um, about the, the way in which, um, you know, marriage by 1929 is just simply not a good enough option for beautiful young women anymore. Um, yeah. and, and that she just does need broader horizons, but her world doesn't offer them and the story doesn't offer them. So it doesn't, it certainly doesn't suggest that she's somebody who could go off and be, go to Paris or become a bohemian or become a writer. Or, so the story doesn't think through other options for her. Um, but it, but it makes very clear that, that the options that she has are completely unsatisfactory. Right. Which I think is tragic, not. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, when, you, when you look at sort of the, the women that gr Zelda grew up with, many of whom had a very, you know, by 1929 were sort of Ali Calhoun figures, even Sarah Mayfield, who was one of their biographers. Um, in the early 70s, you know, had a very different experience where they may have gone through a marriage or, um, you know, or two, and, you know, just realized after that, that, that uh, you know, they might be alone in mod modernity, but that was better than being trapped in those roles or being expected to have that. I was thinking of the term performative southernness, and so that's a lot of syllables, but I think in some ways that's what I get 
when I read her. And, and I want to have, I, I, I as a reader, want to have empathy for both her and Daisy Buchanan. Daisy Buchanan's another character that really I feel like is, is misunderstood. Um, but I did want to ask you, why do you think Fitzgerald, when he, when he uh, the whole background to Great Gatsby, why does he set it in Louisville, which is a very different type of South than Tarleton? And had he set it in Tarleton, would the, would the novel be different? Well, I think the novel would be different in a couple of ways. I think that it, um, if, we, if we begin from the famous premise that you and I are both incredibly familiar with of uh, Fitzgerald's letter to his editor, Max Perkins, where he said that he wanted to write a novel that was new and intricately patterned. And if we think about him consciously trying to do something that's intricately patterned in this very small space, you know, it's such a short novel, Gatsby. Um, and if we take that project seriously, as I do, um, and therefore think that he was very much thinking about how his patterns could hold this depiction of riotous modern life, how could artistic patterns, aesthetic patterns, give that a coherence and a um, and a and a you know and a, a power that was greater than the sum of its parts and all of that um, kind of idea. Um, one of the key things that Nick Carraway says at the end of the novel is that it's a novel of the West, and the characters are all from the Midwest. I think that if Daisy were from the Deep South, that would disrupt that. It wouldn't work the way that he wants this movement between East and West to be right. the primary movement of this story. And it is constantly about movements between East and West, not just in the obvious ways of Nick going East or Tom Buchanan going East, but also of uh, Gadsby's famous um, description of the Middle West that he comes from being San Francisco, um, but also um, the, um, uh, the bit with, um, with Dan Cody, who is um, Gadsby's mentor. Fitzgerald says that he brought the, the frontier violence um, back with him to the eastern seaboard, that there was this, this character of, of, of Westerners um, in a previous generation who had brought that violence to the eastern seaboard. So there's this constant movement in the story. And even um, when Gatsby, you know, what seems like a throwaway line, but um, when Gatsby um, says at the end um, that he complains that, um, that, the, that whoever's on the phone with him is no good to him if, if Detroit is his idea of a small town, it's still Midwestern, right? He's choosing all of these little details are Midwestern so that he can say that the story of the Midwest, of the West, and of and then Nick can turn to it being a story about the Middle West, and that gives it all of this coherence and symmetry. Um, and I see the Deep South would make a story about North and South, and suddenly then you're telling a story about the Civil War, and it's got all of that mythology that comes flooding into the story at that point. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being a story of East and West, it becomes a story of North and South. And of course, uh, Louisville, for those um, who, who don't know, um, I'm doing this from the UK. Um, is uh, a border, uh, Kentucky is a border state. So it's both Midwestern and Southern. So it lets him do both. But also all of those images that I just described, I think are also about a show that it's actually a novel, um, you know, Gatsby is out of place. It's fundamentally a novel about a character who's out of place. And what Fitzgerald does to keep creating that feeling in the, in the reader is to keep creating these images of, of places that are out of place, like that these kind of places that rub against each other um, and, and misplacement, um, being in the wrong place. And so I think that being in a border state works intuitively along those lines where being fixed in one region wouldn't work in that in the same way toward that pattern. That's how I think of it, but I don't know, do you have a different, do you have a different read of why? No, I think that's a great, uh, great interpretation of it. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's let's go back to their eyes were watching God for just a second. Um, dialect is a big controversy, and you know there's the famous story of how Richard Wright and Zora Neale Hurston went after each other over the portrayal of African American life, largely in the South. Um, do you think one response that I often get to that novel is, and I guess we can give the ending away too because. You know, there's a hurricane, and then there is a incident where her the man that she loves um, gets rabies, and she has to shoot him, and then she goes on trial. And there's this whole um, there's a whole sort of 
element of what is, I think, unfairly sometimes called melodrama um, that, that, and that would be critics' interpretation of those big, big plot elements. Um, what do you think she's going for in, in sort of heaping it on so high with, with, uh, with these extremes? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I really love that novel. And I actually have often taught it um, um, in juxtaposition with Gatsby. Um, and it, and it, well, it picks up perfectly on the, on the point we were just talking about because of its relationship, because both novels, are, I should say I do this in the UK because, I, um, and I might not in the US in quite the same way, but in the UK it works really well to actually uh, um, get students there thinking about symbolic geography in America and what its resonances are and how different they are from symbolic geographies in the UK. So, so you can basically use Gatsby to do East and West, and then you can use Hurston to do North and South. And, and she complicates ideas about North and South, so you're not just getting the, um, the kind of cliches of it. Because what she does, and this is, this is my way of answering your question, um, is that um, what she famously does in this novel is she takes the kind of uh, um, familiar 19th century trajectory of the slave narrative of Huck Finn or Uncle Tom's Cabin, where the further south you go, if you're black in America, the worse off you are in the deep south, because of course it was the place where plantation slavery, slavery was um, uh, often more brutal and it was harder to escape. I mean, border states, you were closer to freedom and you could get out. So the deep south was just, you know, it was where you, it was why, it's where the phrase selling you down the river comes from. Um, you don't wanna go down the river. But what Hurston does, which is so kind of revolutionary in 1936, is to have her heroine find happiness the further south she goes. And that's part of that story of reclamation that we were talking about, of reclaiming the African-American experience and saying that by the 30s, there is, there is a life and a culture that we're not just going to dismiss as somehow um, you know, inadequate or, uh, or, or that, that, that it's a, it's a resistance to the ideas that, um, that, that were prominent at the time, that what racial uplift would look like was for black people to try to embrace white culture more. And that that would be what racial advancement would look like. And she rejects that flatly and has her characters, has, has Janie find uh, happiness as she goes south. But I think she is thinking about those old stories as well, those old models. And so the way I think about that, about that ending is that it's really kind of modern Gothic, right? I mean, she's actually brought the Southern Gothic to bear on this. And it takes a very, in its way, it's a very similar turn to the ending of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which suddenly turns mm -hmm. into a ghost story, which nobody ever sees coming. Um, right. And, and so I think she's doing something that's analogous. It's a kind of similar uh, um, turn. And, and then the other thing that she does in that scene that is so important is that it's, is that the, 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 it's, it's playing through um, tropes to use a, a, a lit crit term. Um, it's playing through tropes about African-Americans as beasts as well. And this whole idea of bestiality um, and violence and violence in um, African-American men toward African-American women. And so she takes all of that on and creates this kind of grand guignol uh, um, finale and then, and then finds a way for it really to be what her story is really about, which is voice. And so um, famously, Janie is silenced in this courtroom scene. It's the other kind of big problem people have with the ending. Um, and the kind of standard readings of it that Janie's been silenced and that Hurston doesn't let her defend herself. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I read that a little bit differently and I think it's, I, the way I read it is that it's kind of, it's about, you know, patriarchal culture silencing her and that that's, she, Hurston's not um, defending that, she is uh, um, revealing it because then Janie recovers her voice. And so Janie has to kind of reject that, um, that violent bestial aspect um, and so, so, so uh, it's not to say that Hurston is endorsing those caricatures of black life, but rather that she's wrestling with them and, and kind of, you know, working through them. And that, that's what makes it so great is that it's got those ambivalences uh, um, that, that register deeply with American culture at the time um, sh are shot through the story. Right. Yeah, uh, that's wonderful. I, I love the connection to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, you know, I was thinking as well, so many of her stories, um, many of which are just now sort of finding an audience um, 
but so many of them really question the the great migration which is the you know sort of the big um considered the big springboard for african-american culture to find its own voice and to find its homogeneity outside of the south so i love what you say about her um reclaiming the south and of course eatonville which is the not the town she was born in but the town she was raised in is is famous for being the first black incorporated um, city in america so there was that sort of community there um if we had longer time we would get into hurston's politics which are just um i mean that's a whole other conversation and and uh you know, very timely in a lot of ways. But I did want to ask two final questions. One, is there any place you see in Fitzgerald's fiction in which he is being maybe less picturesque about the South than does he ever force us or rub our noses in the South uh, in the way that Faulkner does or any of the other sort of more canonical uh, Southern writers? I mean, it's a really good question. I, I mean, I, I want you to tell me if I'm, if I'm blanking on anything, but I don't think that he ever does. And I think that the, the most, um, realistic depiction that I can think of is actually in a nonfiction essay that he did in, um, but which is a comical nonfiction essay. So it's a complicated one that you and I've both written about called The Cruise of the Rolling Junk, right. um, which was based on a, a, a road trip that he and Zelda took. Um, and you get there a lot of depictions of the actual encounters that they had with people in the South that for me anyway, it reminds me, maybe weirdly, but it, it, it reminds me a little bit of, um, of the end of Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, mm -hmm. um, when, they have to, when they have to travel, um, I think it's to 10, or is it Kentucky again? It's Kentucky, isn't yeah. it? Um, um, to save um, a little Jewish boy from this uh, um, kind of clan-like story. And the sense that, 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 that you're kind of getting into these small towns in um, the deep South and that they're scary. Um, and that they are that there's a that there's a um, a lurking brutality in there even for privileged rich white people like Scott and Zelda and particularly what comes through that essay is the way that patriarchy pushes back against Zelda and Fitzgerald's playing that essay for laughs but you it's very easy to read that and imagine a dark version of the same exact right. trip. Um, but he doesn't really confront it. I mean, I wouldn't say that he confronts the realities of it, certainly not the way Faulkner does. I, but I'm not sure anybody confronts the realities of the South the way Faulkner does. And could we stand it if they did? I think there's only room for one Faulkner. <laughs> well, and I think sort of the qualities that we love about Fitzgerald, which is the, lyric, the lyricism, but also the, you know, the sort of simultaneous appeal to the lyricism, but also the, awareness that that's a dead end as you say in your essay um you know fitzgerald played with some gothic stuff but i don't think we want a southern southern gothic fitzgerald no. um well okay so final question um hurston and fitzgerald never met let's imagine just for giggles 1924 a few years before hurston i think gets up there but they did have a lot of mutual acquaintances, Carl Van Vechten for one. Um, let's say they met, what would they have talked about? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, but yeah, so if you put, if you get me thinking about um, Carlo uh, introducing them um, in Greenwich Village in, in, as you say, in the, in the early 20s, um, you know, I look, Fitzgerald loved talking shop. He loved to talk to other writers and um, and he took other writers really seriously. I think that, so, you know, we're talking about his kind of passing racism and it's important to think about, but um, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that he was ever, you know, virulently racist in private life. I mean, there are little details we can talk about in the crack up and stuff like that. It's interesting to think actually that crack up essays were written um, just as Hurston was writing their eyes were watching God. So there are these, the, and indeed when um, Faulkner was writing Absalom, Absalom, I mean, those are all in 36. So it's kind of a big year. Um, so the, it's a time of great racial turmoil, obviously, but I think that, you know, Fitzgerald was on the town. He was, he was, uh, he was 
loving jazz. He was not very well versed in jazz, but he was enjoying it. And they were certainly going to Harlem. Now they were slumming from you know a modern point of view, but they were having a great time and, and certainly throwing themselves into the Harlem Renaissance. And, and I think that if Fitzgerald had um, met a, you know, um, um, a Zora Neale Hurston who was studying with Boaz at, um, at Columbia at the time, even as Fitzgerald was writing about um, eugenicism, um, at racial eugenicism in uh, um, the character of Tom Buchanan in Gatsby. Um, I think they, I think they would have talked about, and now that I, th I think they would have talked about eugenics. Um, yeah. And um, and I think they would have and I think they would have talked shop. I think they would have talked about the craft. And I think he would have been really interested in her ideas about about voice and about vernacular. I think he might have learned a lot from her. Yeah, I love that because I that was exactly what I was thinking. He could have he could have found uh, something in that notion of speaking in the folk voice uh, that she that she claimed. Well, we were out of time, and this has been a wonderful, I mean, I could, honestly, I could do this every day, just sit and listen to you talk, so. Oh, likewise. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, beaming in from, from the UK, and um, I should just mention, uh, again, for folks out there, that if you want a very, uh, all of Sarah's work is wonderful, but in particular, her book, Careless People, which is sort of the, the background of Gatsby, but also, her recent New York Review of Books essay, The Oracle of Our Unease, I think is a very important and timely, even though you don't talk contemporary politics, the subtext is there. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I highly recommend both of those, both of those works. Oh, well, thank, thank you so much for saying that. You just made my day saying that, so thank you. <laughs> I really so, appreciate uh, it. But thank you very much, and I uh, hope uh, we will uh, be talking to you. We'll be talking to you tomorrow, probably, because we're working <laughs> on several projects together. But yeah. um, we hope to talk to the audience soon as well. Thank you. Thank you.